Croito is channeled by fluid. And of course, once again, we return to Echo. We all come back eventually. But this time, it's 1915 Echo, and we're back at the smoke room. Of course, we carry on with William's route this time. So, let's get on with it. There's something I have to tell you, and it can't wait. Ralph patched me up and took me walking down the lake. Who? Uh, don't worry about it, you wouldn't know him. My important question is why you're out and about. You got shot for Christ's sake. I hear Murdoch make a breathy, frustrated noise. I wasn't tired and I needed the fresh air. But if you don't grill me, I'd like to get to why I came here. I'm all yours, champ. We didn't get a good look at anything, but we think we heard a struggle. Someone could have been hurt. You didn't check out the source of the noise? Of course not. I'm injured and I don't carry a weapon. Well, the decision was probably for the best. It doesn't give me much to go on. You yeah, certainly didn't notice anything else. Maybe odd sounds or smells. It was too foggy to see clearly, but we did hear the impact of blunt force and cries of pain. We heard wheels too, like they belonged to a cart. And there was a splash. The fox speaks plainly, but his voice is rising to a yell. So you're suggesting I might find a floater if I looked? Well, at least we know it wasn't Sam this time. That's not funny. Didn't say it was. Well, you know, something serious did happen. That lake goes on for miles. Did this happen on the shore close to town? Close to the cliffs where the river winds through. William's ears flick. Well, if you know they were using a cart, there must have been an easy way to transport it. Well, it would be a huge pain in the ass to wheel something up to those steep canyons. I see William's eyes get a spark to him, like he's thinking about something he isn't willing to share with us yet. Well, maybe this is worth checking out then. Besides, Lake Hammer is the closest thing we have to a beach. Well, so what? I know you said you missed him. Well, neither of us has time to lounge around right now. It isn't technically lounging if you find something important. We could all use a break regardless. I can almost feel the wheels turning the coyote's head, gauging by its expression. All right, fine. When can you get off work? Uh, tomorrow, Sunday, Will. Ah, all oh, right. I'm free at noon after church. Well, that means Nick will be available too. Or well, we might need his expertise. At the lake? Well, if what you heard was a minecart, well, maybe. Murdoch does a double take when he says that. But it wouldn't make sense for there to be a... He stops himself and his brow furrows. I do wonder, though. Well, we'll see soon enough. The coyote's gaze turns to me now. Well, what are you doing tomorrow, Sam? I hold my hands up. Now hold on, why do I have to go? You don't have to do anything. Oh, I just think it's a good idea to keep you close. And I'm going to be scarce at the hip if she's going to be haunting those halls. Is she? You don't need to know. I suppose that's a true statement. I'll be seeing the both of you tomorrow then. I'll get some rest, Fireball. The fox gives William a flippant salute with his good paw and shuts the front door behind him as he leaves. Oh, the impulsive fucker's going to get himself sick. Well, I'm not going to swoop in and carry him if he passes out. I doubt he'd ask you to. Oh, which would make it worse. What's wrong? Afraid somebody will find out you're nice? Oh, people think I'm plenty nice. Sure they do. 
Well, if I didn't, I'm not here to win a popularity contest. I thought that's what elections are. Sam, I'm here to get these people results, not good feelings. Those are just part of the package. And how much extra would those cost the mayor? They're free, Samuel. Now, go on home. We're going to have a busy day ahead of us tomorrow. My eyes wander down to his trousers, and there's the smallest trace of wet stain on the front. You don't want me to take care of anything before I go? Oh, sorry, Mood was killed. Uh, bad shit happens all the time here. That shouldn't get in the way of... Well, it's more the implication of what happens next if we find a mine truck out there. That would be strange. Well, that could be catastrophic. I blink. I don't follow. Well, if the CSCG is involved in illicit activities, everything gets real ugly real fast. This town collapses at the mining operation. Maybe not immediately, but there's no sidestep in that. Are you saying that if you did find something bad, you wouldn't be able to do much about it? Well, not nothing. I could report it a fair to make enemies out of the entire town. Just do that, then. The coyote ignores me. Well, funny thing. Somebody out there invited the one person I didn't want to see again to Echo. Then they shut her up in my best place in town to collect intel. Folks don't want me nosing around where I shouldn't be. Pieces are already placed on the board to hinder me. That sounds a little dramatic, so I shrug my shoulders. That must mean it's Mr. Hendrick's fault, right? He just rolled up and told you she's here. He sure was the first to tell me about it. Her identity was hidden by feds. James ain't that smart. But he has money. He also has that small city brain rot. He tilts his head casually. No offence. Full offence taken, but continue. On a worst case scenario, James thinks that Echo could thrive even without the sport of his minds. James, however, is a fuckstick. He really wants people to like him. I have this hunch if he thinks I discovered something rotten at the mines and it was Mr. Briggs' fault. Well, James would claim more direct control of the operation, publicly, pro publicly proposed reform and look like a hero. Couldn't he? What would more likely happen is he doesn't know how to run the ins and outs of a mine and the whole thing gets shut down in weeks. I don't even think of that because he's James. I don't think I'm one of his top concerns by any means. If not him, then who? Well, I have some ideas. But that no matter. I'm not going to tell you to go home a third time. All right, I'm going. Relentless son of a bitch. He pats me on the cheek with his paw, which smells like iron right now. Atta boy. He pushes me out the door and it closes in my face. A sigh escapes my muzzle and I readjust the bulge in my trousers. Then I start walking back a bit awkwardly to the hip. It's very late by the time I get there. Saturday generates a crowd and I can see from all the dishes that tonight was no exception. William left me a bit bothered, so it may be possible for me to find a client if I play my cards right. I've been slacking on taking on impromptu clients the past few days. I don't want to get into the habit. Not to mention I'll be fidgety all evening if I don't, don't get these urges taken care of. Two birds, one stone. Oh, there you are, Sam. Oh, evening. I haven't seen you all day. Have you seen what was spent with the sheriff? Well, yeah. Never mind about that. You won't believe what happened. I'm dragging you to the powder room tonight. Well, I think I ought to be working instead. She leans into my ear and whispers. It's really late, Sam, and the madam said nobody booked you tonight, so it's fine. I whisper back. Well, no more reason to be on the prowl, then. I've seen you in this mood before. Odds are likely you'll sulk around and then shut yourself in your bedroom. I don't do that. But you do, though. I said I don't. Well, have it your way, then. I'm not going to drag you there. Come along, it'll be boring. I pinch the bridge of my nose. She's probably right. 
When I'm impatient, I get prickly. Patients can pick up on that and get chased away. I need a few drinks to mellow out. Even after that, I might not be the most level-headed. Fine, then. Let's see what this fuss is all about, then. Alright, I'm here. I see Cynthia and a whole group of women huddling around a corner, giggling. I knew you couldn't resist some fun. I'm not surprised to see Scarlet and Lucy here, too. These three are always flocking together. The white heron is the first to notice me and holds her talons to her heart. No, you didn't tell me Sam was going to be here. Up until now, I didn't know that he would be. The brawny red squirrel clicks her tongue. I say the more the merrier, love. Shall I make your whiskey sour? Not sure, sure I'd be drinking right now, but the past few days have been pretty long. Sounds nice. I got you, I got you. She makes way the accent table adorned with crystal containers full of mixes and spirits. I take my seat on the love seat near a coffee table in the corner of the room and the ladies follow, sitting across from me. Well, I say we're all reprieve from bumping uglies at the same time. To be honest, I would like another client tonight. That's why we can agree to disagree, love. My back's been killing me. My back's always fine. That's because you ain't got tits in. Oh, you're just a whiner. Oh, I'm out like this one tonight. I love to see it, love to see it. Here's the whiskey, kitten. Keep the tip. I don't promise I don't need another. Hilarious. Where's the sense of humor, Samuel? Keep that up and you'll never bag a man. I got a man. Oh, are we getting spicy already? I'm only on my first shot. His name is Samuel. Cynthia snorts a drink and starts coughing. Oh, for the love of all that's green and good, that short doesn't count. I'm plenty of left man's or I don't need another. You sure his name isn't Will? The other girls cooed. Watch it, Cynthia. She shrugged and took a sip of her drink. You know, I agree with Sam. Oh? If I had a man as big and strong as him, I'd ask him to carry me everywhere. Why, he could just put me in his pocket and I wouldn't say no. Aren't you a sentiment? He's lovely to look at, but thick as plum pudding. She pats me on the leg. No offense, love, this is all in good fun. All right. Jesus. A man is Scarlet. Oh, shit, you never heard of her. Anyway, who was the weirdest fuck the love you had all month? Nothing out of the usual, aside from a few awful dress up requests that I declined. She mimics a chanting motion with her hand and rolls her eyes. Those odd ones go straight to the long list for me. I like to keep things robust but simple. Well, this doesn't count, but a man paid me to pray with him. It was free money, so I said sure. I may not look an angel, but I have the voice of one. Not the way I'm doing you, love. She let out a deep, melodious cry from her core. But all right, all right, it's my go. She leans forward in a chair. Oh, get this. A man, he enters my room and it proceeds as normal. We exchange kisses, he gives me a good cup. Same old, same old. And he asks me, you ever gotten toe fucked? What? No. Excuse me? What is happening? I swear on King Arthur's ghost himself. What does that mean? That's why I asked him and he said it was exactly what it sounds like. One big two up the shitter. That's the worst thing I've ever heard. Oh, that's even better. I'll ask him why he paid me to try it. He says, didn't I already? And I says, no, I'm afraid you didn't, lovely. So did you try it? He wouldn't pay, so I says none of that. Quick handy and out the door he went. We all take a sip of our drinks. Lucy and Cynthia cross their legs. I oh, mean, the request got me curious why somebody ever asked for that. I guess now you'll never know. Can we please talk about anything else? Oh, I know what we could talk about. The trunk. The trunk? That's right, the trunk. Cynthia put a glass down and she stood up, heading to the corner wall behind us. 
I'm glad I remembered. I didn't want Sam to miss something like this. She pushes one of the curtains aside, revealing an oddly coloured panel in the wall. It almost looks like the scales of a reptile. She pushes her paws beneath the scales, shoves it forward and the panel comes loose. Lucy found this cubby hole while she was cleaning. It looks like stuff's been shoved in here for years. The willowy heron billowing behind me speaks up. Well, it's hard to miss, isn't it? I can't be the first person who's found it. Did it ever run through any of your pretty little heads? You shouldn't open things that don't belong to you. I flinch when I hear Ethel's voice behind me, not realising she was in the room. She did more often than not these days, so I shouldn't have been surprised. Oh, relax, this is just junk for all we know. Since his body is already halfway in the cubby hole, dragging out something heavy. It's a trunk about twice the size of her entire body. She blows off the dust and cobwebs. And this doesn't have a name on it. Whoever owned it could be dead for all we know. We should find out what's in it and tell the madam. Who can help me get this lock open? Scarlet crouches in front of it besides Lucy. Ah, simply, that's a cheap lock. See, it's like the insides are rusted. Oh, how strange. Well, let's have a peek when you get the lock off. I hear a series of scratches and clicks. The lock falls to the floor. Cindy and the squirrel push open the top of the trunk together. What on earth? Oh, wow. It's a box full of parlour tricks. What's that supposed to mean? Well, this year's a pack of tarot cards. Those are for making interpretations about your past, present and future. Well, this year's a set of divining rods. What a queer collection to have in a place like this. Oh, there's a scroll here too. Or instructions for levitation play. Oh, could we play, Cynthia? I've always wanted to fly like one of those little birds outside. Well, I don't think it'll work, Lucy Goosey. There's no harm in trying. Well, a bunch of nonsense. I need a drink. Why don't you play around with this stuff, Cynthia? Oh, why not? Because there's things you shouldn't meddle in. Like witchery. Somehow I've answered the real witchery does not look like this. And if it does, well then I feel sorry for the witches. Well, I think it has to be real magic to invite the devil into your home. Well, I don't believe in the devil, therefore I'm not scared of him. Maybe you should believe, just in case. Do you believe in the gods that my parents believed in, Samuel? No. Well, that's different. Get me four candles and the matchbook, ladies. Lucy and Scarlet hop up and down, clapping on Ethel tips back a shot of tequila from a crystal glass. I really, really don't think you should be doing this. Cynthia lowers her voice. You don't have to stick around if you're scared, Sam. Scared? We just want to have some fun, OK? I can play these games because they're not scary. But some people like to be scared of this stuff, and I don't want to ruin their fun. Making yourself scared is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. It was plenty scary as it is. Well, I'm not the one who's going to be scared. Scarlet and Lucy adjust the oil lamps, dimming the lighting of the room. I just sigh and stare at the ceiling, looking where Lucy's looking. Cynthia clears her throat and reads the scroll aloud in a stilted voice. The levitation act can be performed as follows. In a dimly lit area, one must lay supine, gazing at the sky or ceiling. Companions of the Enchanted should stand perpendicular to the body, with their fingers resting beneath the back. The more companions, the stronger the incantation will be. Well, there are people you could probably just lift a damn person. The tricks of spells deceive the soul into trying to enter heaven. If the soul becomes weightless, rising into the atmosphere, so too says the body, still attached. Well, that sounds scientifically true, so I'll believe it. Let's give it a shot. The incantation must be chanted by companions while the enchanted closes their eyes and thinks about being deceased. The phrases must be read line by line and read below. Repeat as much as necessary until the enchanted knows they are flying. Here is a dead body, stiff as a stick, cold as marble, light as a spirit. Lift yourself in the name of Jesus Christ. Cynthia! 
What? You're reading it like it's a recipe. Well, that's a, what how it's formatted. Lucy lies on her back, facing the ceiling. I'm ready. All right, hold your horses. Get on the other side, Scarlet. All right, Ray, we're ready, love. Concentrate, Scarlet, and recite with me. Here's a dead body. I'm dead. Dead. Cynthia is using her storytelling voice for this recital. She told me before that some of her clients don't even pay to have sex with her. They just pay her to read things to them. Can't relate. Scarlet repeats her lines. I can tell her a Scottish brogue is getting softer. Now you tell me she's Scottish? Stiff as a stick. There's, not inter- there's an intonation in both their voices now. Cold as marble. I'm cold. So cold. Vega. Light as a spirit. A sudden wave of disorientation hits me. Like I can't balance. Am I going to pass out? Lift yourself in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm flying. I'm flying. No, she isn't. If she says she is, then she is. See, Sam? Magic is real. Sam? Is he okay? He's fine just a few minutes ago. I'll give him some room. Somebody bring him a glass of water. On it, madam. What do you think could be wrong? He may still be suffering from his prior head injury. What precisely took place in this room? Oh, not much. Just a silly parlour game that Sam wasn't even playing. Oh, wait. What's this? Explain where this trunk came from. We found it in a cubby hole. Uh, here? Yeah, behind the curtains on the east wall. We thought it might be old junk belonging to the madam. Well, I've never seen that trunk in my life. It could belong to the prior owners of this building. Shall I go through it for you, ma'am? Oh, Cynthia found it, didn't she? Well, I think she can handle sorting through it. Most of it looks like junk. Like novelty occult, occult items. Wait, there's a latch in the top of the trunk. I think there's more stuff here. This looks like a lot like the kinds of necklaces my mother used to make. And that's her mark on the back. Why would this be here? She wouldn't give somebody something like this. And this is a braid of kit fox fur. What the fuck? What is this? Why is something like this sitting here? I would also like to know this. And it's in the wall too for who knows how long. It's yours if you want it. Otherwise I do not wish to keep it here. I don't know what I want to do with it right now. I just don't want to be near it. I don't want to think about it. I need to be alone right now. Cynthia? Oh, good. He's come too. Madam's warm hand props me up to the cold room of a glass touches my lips. A drink. Some of the lukewarm water spills out of the sides of my mouth as I try to swallow. Uh, Can you sit up? I think I'm fine, ma'am. Sit up and show me. The shape of the room is a little more clear now. There's a dull throb and ache whenever I look directly into the lamps. We'll help you back to your room. Uh, No, everything's okay. I'm fine. I push my body up off the ground. The whole room looks like how I remember it. Then it looks a little sideways. Harlan, catch him. Something grabs me into the arm. I got him. Ethel, could you help Harlan guide Sam back to his room? Of course, we wouldn't want the gentleman tripping down the stairs now, would we? 
Thank you, dear. I need to inspect this trunk closely. We stop moving. But it lasts less than a second. Dora lets out that chirpy one-note laugh she makes when she notices something, but I can't turn my head to see what it is. I get the feeling I'll lose my lunch or not in my bed soon, so I'm just grateful as we move again. The pressure behind my eyes abates when I'm finally back on my bed. Harlan leaves without saying a word, but I don't hear my door close. Oh, what an evening. She's still here. Should have seen this coming. She's made a habit out of gossip and she knows I want to know what happened. I'd hope she'd give me the courtesy of losing this goddamn headache first. Then again, courtesy's not Ethel's style. I should know better by now. Now, I was expecting a train wreck from this little affair. But that was something else entirely. I thought Cynthia had said something about a necklace belonging to her mom. She doesn't like talking about family. Well, perhaps she ought to. She wants to crack an egg on any of this necklace big in the business. Though her and her little entourage barely have time to break bread with little old me. I can talk to her about this. A pit forms in my stomach. That conversation's guaranteed to go nowhere pleasant. Did you see what the necklace looked like? Of course, it's one of those turquoise get ups. It looks just like her brooch. Why would something like that be in the chest? Well, depending on who you ask, I heard some folks say those brooches are a type of powerful ancient magic. What do you mean? Well, that's sort of hogwash. I'm certainly glad that Cynthia isn't here right now, so she doesn't have to hear this. But the braided piece of fur? Does somebody who thinks natives make magic necklaces? Could be they think their fur is more magical. Ethel takes a drag on one of my cigarettes, which she'd snagged already lit with her asking. Then she exhales. <sighs> but more likely, probably some fucking pervert's fetish idol. I don't know how weirdos think, and I don't expect me to, and don't expect me to pretend I'm psychic. Don't have to be psychic, don't like girls scared sleepless. And I'd be too if I were in her shoes. Did you know they're discussing individuals who collect amphibian eyes? She sucks on my cigarette again. I actually haven't. I remember a past conversation where Ethel was complaining about devil worshippers using eyes of newts because they had heard about it in some play. Since he said that eye of newt was just another name for mustard seed and nobody actually stole any eyes. But I don't want to argue about it. I didn't. I just know what it feels like, believe me. I need to sleep, Ethel. This headache ain't getting any better the longer I'm up. I probably would have said that even if it were a lie. I suppose that poor girl will have to wait until tomorrow to talk to you then. My head fucking hurts, Ethel. I can't keep talking. Well, I thought the company would give you some comfort. It's a headache, Ethel. Every new word makes the pressure in my eyes get tighter. Air appreciated. Where are you going? Could you bring me that glass of water in the powder room? A oh, sure, sugar. Thanks. She puts on her most musical lilt and sings to me. You're welcome. And she finally shuts the door. The biggest sigh I've had in a good while escapes me. It's finally quiet around you. I need a good night's rest. I wake up rasping in the dark. My throat is parched. My tongue feels like sandpaper. I look to the side of the bed for the glass of water to soothe my parched throat. It isn't there. Ethel either forgot or didn't feel like getting it. All right. I can't complain too much. The headache is mostly gone. I just have to walk a few feet. There it is, waiting for me. Wait. Somebody's talking. There's a light coming from Dora's office. So I peek through the crack in the double doors. With all due respect, Mum, it's one thing after another. Broken glasses, fainting spells, miscarriages. Drunks wrestling in broad daylight in the middle of the saloon. Well, that's just life, Harlan. But it doesn't have to be your life. We're both not as young as we used to be. Mr Perkins. You'll be in your seventies before you know it and I'll soon follow. Let me finish, Mr. Perkins. Go on, then. 
no matter who you are, what you do, whatever you arrange, whenever you arrange an obligation, it comes with its own list of conditions. So why are these conditions? Why are these people and their small problems? You could sell this whole place and purchase a pub in the big city. What makes you think I want to be in a big city again? Because that's where you're meant to be. Remember Manny, Barbara, Joe? They love you on the stage. They wouldn't want you here spending your golden years milling about an office. I'm still on a stage, Mr. Perkins. You just can't see it anymore. What the devil does that even mean? It means I have more than enough eyes on me here, and it's exhausting. She looks through the doorway, making eye contact with me. I flinch and I wait for her to yell out my name. But it doesn't happen. You know, Mr. Perkins, you seem to imply that if I were to liquidate my assets here and enjoy the rest of my life in glamour, that you'd be beside me. Why do you presume that? Because I have been I have been all of these years. East coast to west, seaside to desert, we've seen it all. We did, yes. The five of us. You kept following me out of your own volition. Even after all the others were gone. Because even as you age, you stayed beautiful. Mr. Perkins. You're the last blossom out of the last cactus on this patch of oblivion. Mr. Perkins, that is enough. I want you to listen to me. I'm happy here. These women need me, and it feels good to be needed. We had a wonderful wild adventure together. But that time has been over for years, a decade now. Well, I just miss it. Well, I don't. I'm just glad that it happened and that was enough. Ma'am, um, I may ask, why did you have to bring this up? Harlan, did you forget? Because you're the one who brought it up. But I didn't. You did. Just a few moments ago. And I think you know why. She opens one of her drawers and pulls out a large envelope. She plucks what looks like a small picture from it. Give that to me. He snatches it from her grasp, holding it to his chest. He even quickly as the skin of his mouth pulls back bare in his sharp incisors. This was in the hidden place of that trunk too. Stop it. Stop what, Harlan? Either somebody stole a twenty-year-old picture from you, or, more likely, that trunk belonged to you. I'm sorry. What? Have you gone deaf? I said I'm sorry. So you're really admitting it? it? All right. Fine. Don't be sorry, just get rid of it. But those are my things. That's entirely the problem. Either the trunk goes or you do. The hair looked like he's about to bring something up, but stopped, exhaled, and straightened his posture. I'll be gone by the end of tonight. I've given that poor girl the brooch and the braid. Don't ever bring back anything else like it. But you don't understand. I don't need to understand. Good night. I feel like my whole body is rigid. She didn't call my name. Does she expect me not to tell Cynthia? Maybe she wants me to tell Cynthia. I don't know what to do. But it doesn't matter. Because I can't move. I'm stuck in the doorway. My body's numb. Harlan crouches over the trunk and slides it against the floor. He's moving straight toward the doorway. I know what I need to do now. There's somebody awake in there. A Sam. Harlan drops the chest and it clatters to the ground. Why the hell is he here? What the hell do you think you're doing here? I just want to get the water that all left for. A bullshit. Harlan. He turns the door and puts on a falsetto voice. Don't you mean Mr. Perkins? He turned back to me. This man is the pestiest poor liar I've ever met in my life. Nothing I said was a lie. I gave my water and I heard you being loud. There's nothing to worry about, Sam. You're telling him there's nothing to worry about? You don't trust a word I say anymore? Be 
because you haven't acted trustworthy. The hair's big teeth reflect in the oil lamp. Ah, there it is. Good night to you too, madam. You can make me to serve drinks, but don't ever expect anything more. When the doors of the powder room close and we both know Harlan is finally gone, Dora takes a deep breath. The hell was that? A lovesick old fool who doesn't know how to take no for an answer. Who apparently took a sudden interest in a certain kind of literature he used to loathe. Unless it wasn't sudden, he was very good at hiding it this long. I need not point this out, but that man is crossing some lines. I fear something must be done soon if we can't come to a reasonable understanding. Was Cynthia all right? She locked herself up in her room. I'll defend her privacy. But I think carefully for telling her what you saw tonight. Why's that? If she knows what Harlan did and he's still here, I suspect she'll never be comfortable in this saloon again. And Harlan himself is perceptive. If anybody openly casts suspicion on him, he'll start acting worse. Why don't you just get rid of Harlan? If I fire him, he'll be a homeless old man far past his prime. He's an old friend, and I have a hunch that he desperately needs money. And more importantly, he's good at his trade. Not a lot of skilled mixologists in town, unless I poach that Burns boy. But Lord knows his wonderful mother would never agree to that. There's always that reedy pharmacist with hot little hands, but I could never. Oh, what to do, what to do. You're not going to make me bartend, are you? I don't think that role would be a good fit for you. All right. Good. Try to get more rest, Samuel. And remember to drink your water. Ah, yes, ma'am. I crawl into bed. My throat's still scratchy, but at least not in pain now. Mixing drinks could have been a useful skill to learn. I would have turned it down since she needs a long-term replacement. But I still wish she would have asked. Once William finishes up with whatever he has planned for this town, I'll be on my way with my train ticket. Maybe he'll want to come with me. Nah. That's stupid to think. I wish it were true, though. Like most of my days, I wake up to a knock on my door. Yeah? Are you decent, Sam? She sounds different today. Tired. Drained. Well, I sat in my clothes last night, unfortunately. The door opens and she comes in. You must feel sore. Nah, it's nothing. You okay? I was going to ask you the same thing. Last night wasn't your fault. I think it was the drinking. Oh, well. I feel myself get hot as I brush my paw over the scar on the back of my head. I'll probably be paying for this for a good while. How are you feeling after last night? Bad. She crosses her arms. Well, of course she feels bad. The fuck did I ask it like that? Well, I'm not the best ignoring people and infuriate me. For everybody dies, don't they? So every time you hear somebody say something stupid or evil, just think, you're going to be dead one day. Uh, listen, Sam. And time will eat you up. Sam. Yeah? I don't care about what happens to bad people. I want to enjoy my own life while I have it. Life is all we got. There is nothing else. We can agree to disagree. That's not an important discussion to me right now. This brothel's a lot of things, Sam. But it ain't a cage. Last night was the first time in a long time I felt like I did back at the reservation. I don't want to leave, Sam. But if there's anybody here doing what they did there, I don't think I can stay. Where would you go? Well, there's always a way to get by. If I told her about Harlan now, I think she'd leave us for sure. But it seems like he's on his way out. Maybe I don't need to burden her with this sort of knowledge right now. My paw slides down my head to the back of my neck and I rub it. But what if it's nothing? You know it isn't. What was that? Samuel, don't scream like that. It's the worst. I'm sorry, it's just... Did you hear that? 
You what? Well, the truth is, it sounded like me. I know they wasn't. I keep getting the feeling like both me and Cynthia are being watched in this room. It's a heaviness. An oppressive kind of feeling that keeps my tail fur on end, but it never goes away. I feel like it's all around me. Every time I look for the cause, there's just nothing. Just me and her staring back in the mirror. I'm sorry to scare you. We're all a little used to it. That doesn't make me feel better. I'll be out most of the day, but I'll try to be back at night. Shouldn't you rest today? Car, William needs me. A secret stuff? Secret stuff. Well, he won't make any use out of you if you get sick again. Don't push yourself. I shoot the air with my paw in a direction. It'll be fine. Be well. I grab some quick breakfast downstairs before I go. I rehydrate some oats with water in the kitchen, mix in some butter and molasses. Then I chew on some jerky in between spoonfuls. It doesn't take me too long to empty and wash my bowl before I'm on my way. I'm a little bit confused to see William's already waiting outside for me. He's standing against the fence of the post office, eyes listing across the newspaper. Well, howdy, Samuel. Morning. You're uh, here earlier than expected. And here I thought I'd be making my way towards your office by now. Coyote glances at his wristwatch. I've only been here for an hour, Sam. That's not than I would have presumed. You weren't just sitting here waiting for me, were you? Well, don't flatter yourself too much. There's a more of a two birds, one stone situation. Those birds being? Nag me some more, why don't you? What's a fair question? I was waiting for you. I'm also on the lookout. What for? Don't want to talk about it, but you can probably guess. Well, I can guess anything. How about... A sly pair of strong suits hot on your trail. William takes his eyes off the paper, looks at me, and his voice turns snappy and stern. Mom says they're Catholic, Sam. You won't find them on the street on a Sunday morning. I was joking, Sheriff. Why, it wasn't funny. He loads the paper with his wrist, then reaches out his paw, running his claws to one of my ears. They flatten my head as I recoil back, and Will is flicking something to the ground. The hell was that for? You had some dust on your ear like you hadn't washed. It was bothering me. Sorry I'm a bit dingy. A lot happened last night. Well, like what? Nothing I'd like to talk about. A friend had a bad time. She's not cleared the forest neither, so to speak. Well, teasing vague stories not willing to talk about it in detail can get suspicious quick. Not suspicious pretending to read a newspaper in broad daylight was sticking out the hip, I reckon. Who says I'm pretending to read the paper? He puts down the paper and starts to walk down the road in town towards the lake. I have to get with my boys in Burgundy. More baseball? A damn straight. About three weeks behind too, thanks to the guerrillas who tortured town press. Got to get our papers all the way from Colville. They doing all right, these boys. Uh, could be better, could be worse. How can be so invested in reading about a ball game? I don't just read about it, I used to play. I let out a chuckle. You? Yeah, me. It's hard for me to picture you in, Nickers. You see so many of those in the locker room, you get used to it. Ain't it tight? I uh, couldn't complain. You ever play the game yourself, Sam? The sticks and pine cones we played with would hardly count as the real deal. You ever been to a baseball game? Not a professional one, no. So you never had a hot dog then? Of course I've had a hot dog before. I mean, a foot long fresh from the stands. Some of the big stadiums carry ones covered in just the right amount of spicy mustard and sweet relish. Mm, sounds messy. Well, nobody cares. Just eat it like a gentleman if you're that fussed. Guess you don't have to worry about it any time soon. William's whiskers droop. Well, ain't that the truth? A lot less good on here than it was in the big city, huh? Oh, it's night and day, Sam. 
If I didn't have to intervene so much with these people's problems, I'd be bored out of my skull. That's kind of sad, isn't it? It's almost like he's saying there's nothing here for him. I wouldn't have thought that were the case if it weren't for what he told me today. They came as waves dark in the sand. Towels and blankets into the beach along with a few makeshift parasols. We have a few eyes where we can expect Nick and Murdoch. So, what do you want to do until then? Well, I'm not sure. He crouches on his knees and we stare at how the light reflects off the lake. We don't have a lot of time to sit in silence with one another. Usually there's always something to do or something to discuss. The idea of us just sitting here doing nothing, watching the worlds and the water go by seems less real than any hallucinations of the horrors. But we spend at least an hour doing that. And I'm happy. But soon enough William starts to fidget and says he needs to move around. So we follow the shoreline, wading past crowds of playing kids and lounging couples. Until the time grows late and our minds move back to business all over again. Do you think we'll find anything here today, William? Well, I can't say for sure. But if we don't, I'd like to enjoy myself today. Yoo-hoo! Christ. The weasel waves to us from a flannel blanket, sitting with Murdoch a few yards away. The salesman brushes the dust from his pans as he rises, striding to meet us. Good afternoon, Sheriff. William lowers his voice. I thought you said Nick was coming. Oh, he's here. He just had to take care of some business. He makes a quick motion with his hand like he's zipping something up and down. You brought the professor, though. A gentleman. I'm a wounded man. Cliff helped me to put together this lovely lunch we'll be sharing together. I need something to carry my things because my shoulder still hurts like hell. Now you put yourself in danger of that man again, I might be forced to tell your father. Murdoch's smile draws toward and I see a trace of teeth. Draw faster next time, I won't have to. You don't think he gets a hit on him or anything? Both of them said nothing as they turned away to look back at the blanket. Right. We all watched the weasel lift the thermos to his face, gripping it with both hands. His Adam's apple bobs, he chugs the contents. There's something going on. Nick. Oh, good to see you, Sam. He still sounds upset with me. At least he's looking at me when he talks to me now. Mostly. Nothing important. Just glad to have you lend us assistance. Cliff, could you watch the food for us? Oh, not too closely, for all of your sakes. I don't think I could hold myself back on a huckleberry jam, which is scrummy as the last jar. I don't worry, I intend to be back as soon as possible. Well, let's be quick about this. Lead the way, Murdoch. We walk the shoreline for about ten minutes until we come to a valley of cliffs where the lake meets the river. We don't have much room to navigate the rocks. A misstep would mean a tumble into the river. I understand what William meant when he said it would be unlikely for someone with a cart to get out here. We're all sticking close to the rock wall. I'm surprised Nick can fit on these ledges, but he's quick and nimble despite his size. He crouches every few feet to look into the water and pokes a claw at a few minnows. I'll quit that, you'll fall in. Well, stop pretending I am you. Well, I float like a duck in the water. That ain't even my point. It's over there. Both of us turn our heads. Ahead there looks to be the opening mouth of a cave in the side of the wall, but Murdoch walks past it for another few yards and points to a bank on the opposite side of the river. That's what we heard it all coming from. Uh, standing right there. So you know side of a car or a cave on that side of the river. I'm quite confident that my senses are reliable. There's certainly something violent going on over there. Whether or not it's tied to disappearances, whoever wants Cliff dead, I can't say. But I left Clifton alone long enough. I'm heading back to our picnic blanket. Well, I'll take it from here. The fox waves us with the back of his hand as he passes through, back to the direction of the lake. Well, no land bridge in sight. I don't see a great way to cross the river. The big coyote pulls off his suspender straps and unbuttons his shirt. 
I've skinny dipped before, though the male's my age almost most of my life. It feels different knowing it's with two men I've gotten off before. I'm grateful we're far away from any prying eyes between the steep canyons. Nick and I look at one another awkwardly and William notices. William drops his pants and holds his clothes above his head, wading waist deep into the water. I know you can all do what you want, but I'm not walking around in soggy clothes all day. Nick sighs and starts undressing. I do too, turning away. Not because I'm embarrassed, but I don't want to get a bone in the and Nick or Will outside in broad daylight. When the last of my clothes come off, I step into the water, and the current almost blasts me off my feet. Why didn't you say the current was this strong, Will? It wasn't when I first got in. I look straight. Widen your foot in and keep walking. I shake the water out of my fur as fast as I can once we get to the land. It's almost like a black hurricane when Nick shakes off his fur, getting me wet again. Will, this fucking sucks. It gives me a look to shut me up. We wait quietly on the bank for about five minutes. I look at Will as gaze is staring forward at a rock face. Then I look at Nick who's tilting his head every so often, frowning. I feel dry enough to start putting my clothes back on. So does Nick. Will does too, but much more slow like. His ears splay forward and his gaze is more intense, like he's alert. There. There what? Will is on his feet and headed toward a rock face. Looks like he's about to walk straight into a wall. The hell is he doing? Nick shrugs at me but gets to his feet as well. As William looks like he's about to make a collision, he stops, sidesteps and disappears. We follow as quickly as we can. William's voice drops to a whisper. Oh, that's a cart. What kind of place is this, Nick? Oh, I do not know. This could be a discontinued shaft CSG Site A. Well, I can tell it's not seen recent use. Don't any of you all hear that? I stop to listen. There's wind, and there's a sound from the nearby river, but that's all. Well, seems like we might not be dealing with miners at all. Well, I'd recognise that code anywhere. The coyote crouches down, his tawny tail swishing from left to right as he goes deeper into the tunnels. Did he say code? Yeah, he sure did. What does that mean? There were no sounds. I didn't hear anything either. How did he know to come here if he's not following somebody? Oh, I pondered this too. His tracking senses are exceptional. Perhaps we cannot detect what he can. We should follow him. Right. I can sense a sudden change in the pressure of the room. The hairs on my tail stand on end. It's some sort of metal drawbridge in this room. It's suspended over a chasm that whistles with the draught rising from below. The sound it makes as it sways is grating, like the crunching of iron bone against bone inside their own sockets, as if metal could have arthritis. Well, it sounds like they're moving slow. If we keep a distance, we can sneak up on them. Who's moving slow, William? Well, there's some not-so-nice men. Some off riot they're using the code of a don I knew without a doubt. Something they're coming out across the bridge. Spies of a dawn? Out here, in Echo? I know it's just technically became a city two years ago, but isn't it too small to attract that kind of outfit? You know that my ex-wife came back, Sam. She could have brought them with her. Me and Nick look at one another. I'm not saying I don't believe you. Don't patronise me, Samuel. This was Murdoch's report, not mine. It's possible we deal with ordinary counterfeiters or robbers. There's no doubt about it. I heard them use the code for a specific family I never told anybody about. That's an ordinary thing to hear. Sets off alarms in my head. Well, we're wasting too much time discussing things when we could be crossing that bridge. Nikolai walks up to the bridge and grabs one of the wires connecting the bridge to a bolt in the stone. He lets go, blowing his paw off. 
on whether you should use this bridge. It is not fit to use. Well, yeah, normally I think that too. So I just watch two people cross it at once. That bridge is sturdy as it can be. What? No. The support cable is rusted through. It will not hold one person. Let alone two. It must be some sort of trick. Somebody just wanted to cross this bridge. He said he just saw two people cross it, Nick. But he also said he heard two people talking. We are both here no such thing. The more I think about this... William, you asked me to be here today because of my knowledge of the caves and mining infrastructure, yes? I did. And listen, my paw is covered in rust. I know what rust smells like. I think you're saying it makes sense. I know what I saw. We can only catch them off guard if we're quick. Nick and William don't usually argue. They tend to agree on pretty much everything. It's weird to see them so tense on a matter as simple as crossing a bridge. Either way, this don't feel very productive and I don't want them to fight anymore. It makes me feel too sad. I know what I need to do now. I don't doubt for a second that William saw what he thought he saw. But I know for a fact that I've seen impossible things while living in this shithole. Either the bridge is fine and Nick imagines he sees rust, or there ain't any people on the other side of that bridge. Well, fine, just test the damn thing with the rock if you're so sceptical. Well, I don't see any nearby. Well, he pulls a baseball out of his pocket. If I ever get to use this anyway. He tosses the baseball and a hand it at the bridge. There's a big impact from a bounce and then a crunch. We all stare as half the bridge crumbles away with the barest amount of applied pressure. What the hell is going on? If they didn't go that way, then where did they go? Whoever they were, they are not here now. I've noticed how uneven the shaft scaffolds are, and it makes me nervous. This tunnel will cave in with time. It would not be smart to stay here. And I will drag you kicking and howling out of here is what I must do to save your life. William closes his eyes and takes a deep breath. I'll oh, save your strength, we're done here. Then he doesn't say anything else and turns around. We follow him out of the tunnel. We walk forward without talking much. Nick looks like today aged him another year and William hasn't had the time yet to lick his wounds. We strip when we get to the river again. There's no shyness now, just a bit of numbness. When we get to the other side, we sit together in silence, letting the sun and the dry air get rid of the wetness again. Hey, Will? Yeah? Well, I just want you to know you did nothing wrong today. That isn't true, but thank you. The mines are not the world you know. The world you know is people. Thank you for being my friend. Will lets out another loud sigh, looking down. You're welcome, but I think it was a lousy friend today. Wrong. I would stay to argue, but you're both still naked and I am very hungry. I'll see you both back in the picnic blanket. We both say our short-term farewell to Nick's. we let the rest of the river water dry off. William leans back against the rock wall and points his muzzle to the sky. I made a fool out of myself, Sam. I'm sorry you're not used to it. That puts a smile on his face. I guess you're rubbing off on me. You sure? You don't tend to ask for that. His smile is bigger now. A filthy thing to say. I think I like a little bit of dirt. I know you well enough now to think you do too. I rest my cheek against his. I'll expect him to push me away with his paw. He just sighs real loud and pushes his cheek against mine. He wasn't kidding that he's sensitive. Now he's staring between his legs. There's two now, huh? I can tell he's putting in a tremendous effort to get soft again. Now seriously, Sam. What was wrong with me today?
Well, I hear stories about gases in the mines. Apparently they can make you see things that aren't real. And that's just the fun gases. No gas is a fun gas. Well, there's the kind we breathe. And some can make you sound funny. Saw a clown do that once. But yeah, the worst ones can kill you. Mines are dangerous. Especially condemned or abandoned ones. Should probably stop waltzing into them expecting we won't get hurt at least once. Maybe we should have brought a canary. Or Professor Tibbet so he can condemn us for acting crazy. That mine's too much when he's sane and sober. I can't imagine how stressful it would be if he were the one losing it. I think the dumbest thing I did today was throw that ball. Gonna miss the hell out of it, but it just made me so angry to look at it sometimes. I wanted to throw it. I wanted to hurt it so a damn baseball can feel pain. So I had no control today. What a goddamn wash of a day. I know to crash a pity party. What mattered today is knowing there's something to Murdoch's story. There was a cart in that cave. And he did follow someone in. You could have found that mine exit otherwise. Well, I was thinking about that myself. I don't have an explanation other than there really being somebody there. Which makes this so frustrating all over again. You'll figure it out. You always do. So I don't bother lying to you. Well, I'll take that as a compliment. Hate to say it, but uh, I can tell. Huh? Oh, for Christ's sake. I'm laughing at him now. Ah, oh, just a moment. Alright, there we go. I want to throttle you proper for these. Well, at this rate. Oh, let's just get dressed. We've been naked in broad daylight for too long. Heaven forbid people start saying th true things about us. Well, heaven forbid's too much. That's why it's your thing, not my thing. Well, it could be everybody's thing. Oh, don't ruin the mood, please. The sun is much higher by the time we get back to the picnic blanket. But the sky is still blue. Oh, welcome back. Two of you took a while. Well, I told you this summer to calm me down if I made some mistakes today. So did he. Well, I'm here, aren't I? Well, that's an impressive feat. How is Sam? Ah, oh, William. Ah, oh, so rocks rattling around in my head today is all. Nick had been filling us in. It really did connect to the mine. The location did, at the very least. I couldn't manage to get a lead on any potential crimes or involved suspects. But I'll be scouting the area with Todd in the immediate future. I think I just need to try and enjoy the rest of my day. You know, I've never really seen you relax in public. Murdoch's right. Though it's hard to think about a circumstance where William ever relaxes. He's stiff even when I'm taking care of his balls. A correlate force of habit. What do you say we invite Will inside to the stag tonight to loosen up? Was that the all male dive you were speaking about earlier? Nick made a humming noise. Uh, that may not be the best decision. Ah, the Nick brings it up. I think my presence wouldn't sit well with a bunch of wobblies. Nick makes the humming noise again. Uh, I've changed my mind. You can be our friend first and share a second for a single night. Don't make trouble and you won't find trouble. Well, I should not have to tell you not to wear your badge. Obviously. You can say you're arresting me if anybody gets suspicious. Your know, items have already agreed to go. Of course, there's nothing wrong with enjoying a nice cup of tea at home instead. I thought not everybody's body is meant to, meant to be the life of the party. I've been to plenty of parties in my life. It's just this particular one could be considered unseemly of me on multiple levels. Why's that? Scared to try something new, William? I've heard you call him by his first name before. Because he hasn't. It's the first time for everything. William laughs. And it's also a never. I don't put much stock in nevers. It's just exciting to see you in a different light is all. You know, in the context of when my father has forced me to run errands for him. Well, I apologise for that. I'd rather work with you than deal with him. And no offence. Oh, none taken. That reminds me, I brought the pinhole camera. Since this is one of the few times we can gather in the daylight, I want us to take a photograph together. 
Learning the production process of Fos's photosensitive paper yesterday was nothing short of fascinating. The fuck is he even saying? Thank God I'll never have to learn any of that. I can take the picture. Because taking the picture means you never have to be in the picture. How does the thing work? I pick up the weird wooden box which feels heavier than it should be. And make sure you angle it carefully so your face isn't in the shot. I don't know what that means, but alright. Rest the camera against that rock wall and open the slat for about 30 seconds. And then? Alright. Oh, you can't answer me for 30 seconds. Ha! Now then? I close the slat and hand me the pinhole camera. Easy. Here you go. The fox pulls out a black canvas cloth and what looks like a heavy metal box of liquid. I hand him the box and he goes inside of it. It looks real stupid. You okay in there? I was too excited to wait to see how this one turned out at home. I can see that. The picture's done. Already? I bet it came out beautiful. He hands a small piece of paper to me. Fuck. And there we go. <laughs> that was a good update. Nice to see everyone relaxing slightly. Just save this over here. And say that is it. For the smoke room for this time, the next smoke room video will be in a while because we have a couple more updates I'm not doing. But we will definitely be heading back on Nick's route in a while. And of course there's more from Echo to come at some point because we will definitely, absolutely, no doubt about it, be doing Arches when it comes out. I've had a chance to play uh, Howley's Patron update. Oh, it's so good. Great writing, art, music, everything's just coming together perfectly with that. Oh, I'm looking forward to doing it. But uh, next week, because I know a lot of people have been waiting for this, we are going back to Far Beyond the World. And it's going to be a long update. So I've been asking people, you may have seen on my uh, Patreon or Twitter accounts, asking people, uh, would you like two parts or one epic length? Uh, so far, it looks like we're doing two parts. So, based on that, we'll be doing part one next week, and part two will follow just one week later. If there's an unexpected change, then there won't be a video next week, because I'll be too busy recording what would have been part one. I'll put everything together for a long one. But it looks like we'll get two together for that. So, far beyond the world, when shall we three meet again? Part one will be next Saturday. And, of course, before I sign off for now, I have to give a quick mention to Dissonance, Seven King, Grizz, Samuto, The Beholder, David Taylor, Popot, Anubis Silverwind, Brandon Bradford and Ida Corval, who are my top patrons. I say special thanks not only to them but to all the patrons I have. Uh, hopefully this sounds okay, I can't tell very easily. But uh, my microphone is on the way out after six years of very solid service. It's been a great microphone. I've turned the gain up a bit so we have some decent sound but I've had to spend quite a bit of money on buying myself a new microphone and the patrons have really helped a lot with that. Uh, thank you for your contribution. They come almost done. Don't worry. I'll feed you in a moment, okay? So it looks like it is supper time for dogs so that means I should head off now. And until next time, bye for now. <laughs>